Our scripture reading today is Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So of all the professions out there, I think that sales is my least favorite. And within that category, I would say that telemarketers is at the very bottom. There's just something about getting unsolicited phone calls from people trying to sell me something that really irritates me. I don't trust them. I don't trust the products or services that they're selling. And I think that what irritates me the most is that they won't take no for an answer. If you try to politely decline, they just continue with their script and keep you on the phone as long as possible. I try to avoid answering calls from telemarketers, but when they do catch me, as soon as I know who they are, I cut them off tell them I'm not interested, and then hang up before they have a chance to respond. It seems rude to hang up on people like that, and maybe it is. But in my mind, all telemarketers are evil. They're all trying to rip me off, and none of them is honest. Of course, it isn't fair for me to lump all telemarketers together. Each person is unique. Each person has a story that has brought him to the point of calling my number, and I'm sure that many of them are decent people who would rather be doing something else. So my real problem isn't necessarily with individual telemarketers. Maybe it's more with the telemarketing industry and the businesses that are a part of it. But even within that group, I'm sure that there are legitimate businesses with legitimate products and services. So it's not fair for me to lump together every business that makes unsolicited phone calls and say that they are all evil. My personal experiences have shaped my opinion of telemarketers, but that doesn't mean that my opinion is a fair or accurate representation of that group. I'm not the first person to lump a group of people together and form an opinion of that group based on generalizations made from isolated experiences. And I know that I won't be the last, but that doesn't mean that it's right for me to do it. Throughout history, there have been professions that have been respected and admired and others that have been looked on with loathing and disdain, and today is no different. I did a little bit of research to see what people's current views of professions are in terms of respect and trust. And even before COVID-19, nurses were at the top of every list, and they were usually followed by doctors. And then down at the bottom of the list were car salesmen and congressmen. Now, there was some variation in the middle, but unfortunately, clergy was closer to the middle than the top. And in one list, clergy was just one place above journalists. There's one profession that was consistently in the top half that probably wouldn't rank so high if a poll was taken today, and that is law enforcement. Police in this country have been under attack for several years now for a variety of reasons. Some of the reasons are legitimate. There are legitimate cases of abuse, brutality, racism, and a number of other problems that happen within police departments. Sometimes these problems are dealt with immediately, and sometimes the problems are ignored or swept under a rug. So it's quite possible that some police departments need a complete overhaul. However, just because some cops are bad and some police departments are corrupt doesn't mean that all are. And it certainly doesn't mean that it's okay to ambush and attack officers who are trying to keep our community safe. And it's very disturbing to me that people are trying to to defund police departments and that some mayors and some police chiefs are not supporting the officers that risk their lives each day to keep the rest of us safe. Whether we like it or not, we need people who are willing and able to enforce laws. There is a place in this world for social workers But when my life or property is being threatened, I don't want an unarmed social worker to come and talk to the criminal. 
I want an armed policeman who can arrest the criminal and get him off of the streets. Anarchists are being given some leeway to wreak havoc right now because it's an election year. But I guarantee you that at some point, law and order will be restored. There is no government in the history of the world that has promoted anarchy because anarchy means that those in power would be out of a job. Democrats want Republicans to be out of a job, and Republicans want Democrats to be out of a job. But neither side wants both sides to be out of a job. And both sides want someone with a gun to protect them. If our police departments are taken away, that doesn't mean that we'll be without law enforcement. It just means that our local law enforcement will be replaced by state or federal law enforcement, which would include our military. And if our state and federal law enforcement is taken away, they'll be replaced by NATO troops or some other form of world government. Somebody somewhere is going to govern us and be in control. There will always be rules and there will always be someone to enforce them. And as long as sin is on the earth, the people enforcing the rules will be imperfect. And that doesn't mean that we don't need laws and law enforcement. Even Seattle's autonomous zone has rules and people with guns enforcing the rules. Anarchists say that they don't want government, but what they really mean is they don't want someone else governing them. They want to be the ones in control. Ever since Satan rebelled against God and took a third of the angels with him, there has been a struggle for power. Although this struggle takes place in the spiritual realm, it manifests itself in the physical realm. One of Satan's tactics in this spiritual war is to divide us up into groups and then pit us against each other. For example, I've had some bad experiences with salesmen, particularly telemarketers. So Satan tells me to put them in a box and isolate myself from them as much as possible. And if I get stuck talking to one of them, then Satan tells me it's okay to be rude because after all, I didn't give them permission to call me in the first place. And that's a small box that may be unique to me, but we all have our boxes. Satan divides us up by skin color, politics, religion, social status, and everything imaginable. And then he tells us lies to get us angry and fighting with each other because it creates chaos. He wants chaos because it, it is the opposite of what God wants. God wants order. That's why he gave us instructions for how to live. Satan foments hate because God wants love. Satan encourages rebellion because God wants obedience. These same spiritual struggles, struggles were taking place when Jesus walked the earth. Gentiles were in one box, Jews were in another. The Gentiles were divided up into Romans, Greeks, and everyone else who wasn't a Jew. And then, of course, the Jewish box was also divided up into smaller boxes, the biggest two boxes at the time being the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Although the Pharisees and Sadducees were in separate boxes, they were united in their dislike for Jesus. And all the Jews were united in their dislike for tax collectors. So when Jesus invited a tax collector to follow him, and then sat down and had a meal with tax collectors and other so-called sinners. It was a big deal. He was socializing with the most hated members of society. So let's take a closer look at this passage and see what Jesus says when he is criticized for his actions. Our passage begins with Jesus calling Matthew to be a disciple, and then Jesus goes to his house for a meal that in Luke's account is described as a great feast. We don't know much about Matthew other than that he is called Levi in Mark's and Luke's accounts and that Mark identifies him as the son of Alphaeus. That's about all we know. I'd be surprised if this was Jesus' first interaction with him, but it's possible. What I'd like to focus on today is the interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. When the Pharisees see Jesus in Matthew's house eating and drinking, they say to the disciples in verse 11, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? It is interesting to me that they asked the disciples to give an answer for Jesus instead of just asking Jesus. If Jesus is the person with whom they have a problem, then why don't they ask him? And if they have a problem with Jesus being there, shouldn't they also have a problem with the disciples being there? The same question should be asked of the disciples. Why are you in a tax collector's home eating with people from whom you're supposed to be isolated? Jesus gives an answer before any of the disciples take a stab at it, 
but I wonder if any of them would have had the right answer. They may have been wondering themselves, are we supposed to be here? Aren't we going to get cooties? It is true that following Jesus may lead us into uncomfortable situations and may cause us to interact with people with whom we wouldn't normally interact. And it's true that at the time we're in the thick of things, we might not have a good answer for why we're in the situation that we're in. However, if we truly are following Jesus, then he will give an answer for us the way he does in this passage. The key for us is to make sure that we are following Jesus and not someone else or something else. I've heard of people going to bars and strip clubs and other places that followers of Jesus don't normally frequent for the purpose of evangelism. That's fine if you're truly sharing the gospel and calling people to repentance. But if all you're doing is satisfying your flesh under the pretense of serving Jesus, then you should rethink what you're doing. So here's the response that Jesus gives for his actions in verses 12 and 13. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The beginning and end of Jesus' statement are very straightforward. Only the sick need a physician, and only sinners need to repent. That's just common sense, and those two statements are all that is included in the accounts given in Mark and Luke. However, Matthew includes an extra line in verse 13. He says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is a quote from Hosea 6, verse 6, and to understand what he means by it, we need to read it in context. But before we go to chapter 6, I'll give you a little bit of background. Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah, and he prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel from about 755 B.C. to about 710 B.C. The northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C., so his ministry was in the years surrounding that time. The northern kingdom's primary offense against God was spiritual adultery in the form of idol worship. But Hosea brings another charge against them in Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, that relates to what we're going to read in chapter 6. So let's look at that first. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. I want you to remember what it says in verse 1. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. So now let's read Hosea chapter 6. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew it goes away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And your judgments are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men they transgress the covenant, there they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers, and defiled with blood. As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. They have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the harlotry of he Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of, captives of my people. So we see that chapter 6 begins with the call to repentance. It says, Come and let us return to the Lord. Hosea could stand up and preach that message anywhere in the world today. Come and let us return to the Lord. Uh, and then it's interesting to me in verse 2 that he says, On the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. 
to me that parallels Jesus being raised up on the third day that we might spend eternity in his sight. Then next we see that both the northern and the southern kingdoms have been unfaithful and because of this God has sent prophets to slay them with words in hopes that they will repent. The reason that he is warning them before punishing them is found in verse 6 and it is what Jesus is telling the Pharisees to go and learn. It says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It is merciful of God to give his people warning after warning before punishing them. It was merciful of God to set up the sacrificial system so that people were able to sacrifice an animal instead of themselves. And it was even more merciful of God to send his only begotten son to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. God desires to be merciful and is merciful, but he also expects his people to demonstrate mercy. Remember what I highlighted in Hosea 4 verse 1. One of the charges against Israel was, there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Mercy means loving kindness. God wants his people to be loving and kind the way that he is loving and kind. But instead, they were swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery. There was bloodshed upon bloodshed. He didn't want them to have to bring sacrifices or burnt offerings. He just wanted them to love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves. This is what Jesus wanted the Pharisees to learn. The Pharisees were great about following the law, especially their man-made laws. And they were also good at condemning anyone who broke the law especially their man-made laws. So they were experts in making sure people knew what sacrifices and offerings to bring and when to bring them. But there, there was no love in their words and there was no mercy in their actions. The Pharisees claimed to have great knowledge, but if they knew God as well as they said they did, they would have known that what God truly desired. And if they loved God as much as they said they did, they would have acted upon that knowledge and demonstrated love and mercy. Instead of putting all tax collectors into a box labeled sinners and shunning them, they would have gotten to know the tax collectors as individuals and shared with them their knowledge of God and their love for God. They would have encouraged them to repent and taught them the right way to live. They would have done what Jesus did. Jesus reached out to tax collectors and sinners because they were the ones who needed him most. But he also did it because he desired mercy he desired to demonstrate mercy by treating all people with loving kindness, regardless of what box society had placed them in. And he desired to teach others how to be merciful so that they could in turn demonstrate mercy to others. I know that people are angry about a lot of different things right now, but putting people in the boxes and then pummeling those boxes with hate is not the answer. Revenge is not the answer. Love is the answer. Mercy is the answer. Jesus is the answer, and people should be able to find that answer in a church. Unfortunately, not every church is a safe place to go to find the answer. Earlier, I talked a little bit about how there are legitimate problems in some of our police departments. There may even be some changes that need to take place across all departments. Well, the same can also be said about our churches. There are reasons why clergy is not the most trusted and respected profession. There are reasons why people lump all Christians together into a box and then don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. And there are reasons why so many churches are dying. It is unfair for people to paint every pastor in every church with a broad stroke and say that just because one pastor or one church is corrupt, all pastors and all churches are corrupt. But the truth is that there shouldn't be any corrupt pastors and there shouldn't be any corrupt churches. We can't expect our, de police de our police departments and our governments to be honest and transparent if our churches aren't honest and transparent. We can't expect others to demonstrate love and mercy if we don't demonstrate love and mercy. Reform needs to start with us. Revival needs to start with us. And the first step is repentance. As individuals, we need to repent of everything that is keeping us from being the person that God has called us to be. And then as a church, we need to repent of everything that's keeping us from being the church that God wants us to be. It is only after we have removed the logs from our own eyes that we will be able to see what we can do to make our community and our nation a better place. So let us join the Pharisees in learning what it means to desire mercy. 
We won't need to tell God when we have the answer. It will flow out of our hearts, and he will hear it in our words and see it in our actions. So let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are merciful, that you desire to be merciful to us, and that you desire us to exhibit that same mercy. Father, I pray that we would truly learn what it means to be merciful and that we would demonstrate it in our words and in our actions. I pray that when people see us, they would see your love, that they would experience your love. And I pray that we would share that love with everyone, regardless of what box society might have placed them in. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.